So today I'm going to talk about um, a flyby of um, one of the smallest objects in the solar system. But I also happen to be involved in the Juno mission to Jupiter, the largest object in our solar system after the Sun, largest planet in the solar system. And um, at the Fisk Planetarium, I've got a show uh, which will be running the 14th and 15th of March. And uh, we've got some new images which we project onto the dome and you get to see the the swelling clouds and everything, which is really cool. So, um, pick up a fly if you're interested. Does everybody have 3D glasses? You will need them for this talk. So what I'm going to do is tell you about the New Horizons flyby of this small object in the outermost part of the solar system called Ultima Thule. And um, I'll tell you what we've learned from this small object. Uh, I've been involved with New Horizons since the very beginning, working with Alan Stern to get this mission uh, uh, funded and then off the ground. Uh, I've actually stepped back from, uh, from New Horizons to work on Juno, um, but I was able to go and join the team and Brian May <laughs> at the uh, flyby. So I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Okay, but let's go back to the launch. <laughs> And lift off of NASA's Blue Horizons spacecraft from Tampa, voyage from Business Class, Pluto, and then beyond. Let's continue sense. Everything continues to look good. As the atmospheric vehicle climbs away from Florida's east coast, the five solid rocket strap-on boosters are burning just fine, sending the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to the very edge of our solar system. Okay, so we have launch. Of course, that was a long time ago, <laughs> the other date. Um, we got a big, uh, fast, uh, light, small spacecraft with a lot of rockets behind it, uh, and uh, was out, went past Jupiter, and then uh, past Pluto, and, and on its way. So this is a really small spacecraft. It's about the size of a baby grand piano. And um, by now, it had the, um, plutonium radioactive uh, power systems uh, have about 200 watts of power. So if you remember those old light bulbs, a 100 watt light bulb is just two of those. Uh, and the transmitter on the dish, the dish is about six foot wide and um, it communicates back to the earth with a 15 watt transmitter. So that's uh, sort of the power of a refrigerator light bulb. <laughs> It takes uh, six, w six hours each way to communicate with the spacecraft by now and the transmission rate is about three kilobits per second. So the average phone is what? Boo! What do you, what do you get these days? 50 meg? Something like that? Megabits per second? Yeah, okay. So this is, uh, you have to keep this in mind when we talk about this. Now what about the instruments? We've got a whole bunch of instruments, of course. Um, we uh, have a camera. Uh, the UV instrument was built in uh, at Southwest Research down in San Antonio. Ralph, the wide angle color camera, was built here at Ball Aerospace. Uh, Laurie, long range camera, was in Maryland. Pepsi, particle instrument, also uh, in Maryland. Uh, we use the radio antenna to do radio science. We'll talk about that. We call that Rex. SWAP is a plasma instrument, also built down in Southwest Research in San Antonio. And then, of course, there is the student dust counter. <laughs> instrument designed, built, tested, operated, and analyzed by students here at the University of Colorado. And um, my understanding, a lot of these people have um, become important people in the field. Chesley here is, uh, does a lot of work uh, on missions here at LASP. Uh, this woman here is in fact in charge of um, uh, running the instruments on New Horizons, all of them. And a lot of these people have moved on to professional careers. About 40 students have come through the program. And uh, just this week, uh, a student got a paper published on dust counter results out to 38 AU. So about 10 uh, uh, papers have come out on these results. So this is a really major thing that LASP does 
training students, they get experience in putting these instruments together, either to fly another spacecraft or uh, as small spacecraft that go places. So that's a main part of what we do, and it's been extremely useful for the New Horizons spacecraft. So what have we uh, been up to? Well, starting off way back with launch back then, we had this flyby of Jupiter that gave us an extra kick to get us out to Jupiter in, uh, out to Pluto in good time. Got to Pluto July 2015. And then we were like, well, now what do we do? Uh, well, we had limited power after this flyby, so we couldn't go very far. Uh, but we get, came up with a candidate. But let me just first talk a little bit about what we saw at Pluto. Completely unexpected. I thought this was going to be a boring lump of ice with maybe a few impact craters. But, oh no, lots of really cool stuff. Uh, this is the moon Sharon, which is um, uh, a, a very large moon and they sort of orbit around each other. And then we have a bunch of small objects um, which are these uh, moons here. Okay, so this is what we found at Pluto and uh, here um, there is a movie there we go. Um, this is a flyover put together uh, really amazing bizarre terrain and so you can see uh, this is ice, ice that's been covered in brown gunky stuff that has rained out of the hazy material of the atmosphere. Uh, this is probably um, a sort of a material that's hydrocarbons that have come from the atmosphere. The white stuff is relatively fresh ice. This is nitrogen ice that is convecting in glaciers. And then the big mountains sticking up are um, uh, water ice, which is much uh, lower density, floats, and much more rigid than the flowing nitrogen ice. And then we see some really bizarre features uh, where we have the, this is actually a thought to be a, uh, a volcanic vent, and then there's all sorts of surface, uh, other surface features. So this is my favorite picture from Pluto, uh, totally unexpected. Uh, it has these big mountains. These mountains are as big as the Rocky Mountains. We have these glaciers of nitrogen. And we have hazes. Doesn't this look like a planet to you? <laughs> <laughs> dwarf people are people. Dwarf planets are planets. Okay. So all sorts of cool stuff that we learnt. Uh, look at those beautiful blue. When the sun went behind, we see these scattered blue light, the way we get scattered blue light in our atmosphere. So these are incredible features, and uh, we've got a 3D picture here. So these are sort of strange ridges. They're really quite high. They're maybe as high as this building. Ridges of methane ice, we think, sticking up. Uh, really bizarre, then you have impact craters, and then the impact craters seem to be full with maybe nitrogen ice down in the underneath. Brand. Yep. Green to the left. No, red, blue, blue, blue to the right, red to the left. And it's opposite to L and R. No? Did it not work? If in doubt, try the other way. <laughs> okay, we ready to go to the next one? Yeah? Try that one. Well, yeah, the mountains are valleys otherwise. Okay. Okay, and now look at that one. Whoa! I think this is my favorite. So that smooth area is. It's these. This is a glacier. It's convecting. It's turning over. You can see they have these polygon shapes. Oops! It went back. Let me go back. Here we go. Um, that tells you it's turning over like a pot of soup. So these are uh, are convecting systems um, 
and then the ice, the water ice is the more rigid stuff that's sticking up above. So you say that's nitrogen ice? Yes, the, um, yeah, the, the convecting uh, stuff, the pale stuff is nitrogen ice. Are those convecting. Sorry? Are those Hadley cells? The Hadley cells, yeah. uh, not quite, they're just convective cells. Right. Anybody calculate so, time constant for turnover? Yeah, it's about three million years. <laughs> yeah. Okay, which is short in the age of the of the of the solar system. Okay, so that's we've done Pluto. Move on. Next thing. What do we do next? Well, the problem is we needed to find an object. And we didn't find one until very late. And the real reason is that the location of Pluto in the sky right now is that it's close to the center of the Milky Way. And that means that if you're trying to look for a small object moving relative to the stars, you've got a heck of a lot of stars in your field of view, so it makes it difficult. The other problem is that after the Pluto flyby, we only had enough fuel to move the spacecraft by about two degrees. So that's two fingers at full arm's length is about two degrees. That's not a lot, so we had to find an object within that field of view and you know that was tough so we we worked with Hubble Space Telescope and a lot of ground-based telescopes and eventually found uh, um, about a handful of candidates and in the end we chose to pick this one which was found in 2014 um, called MU69 they have these silly um, zip code names <laughs> but we labeled it Ultima Thule which is a uh, often used in a lot of northern European languages to sort of talk about some things right at the edge of the edge of the world uh, you know way the heck out there in other words that's what that translates into it's not a, a, a official name yet I don't know if it'll ever be official but that's what we call it okay so how big is Ultima Thule well um, <laughs> If Pluto is an exercise ball, then Ultima Thule is the size of a ping pong ball. So it's pretty small compared even with little Pluto. So it's pretty small across. We estimated about 25 miles across at the time. Now, we flew past Pluto 2015 and we were estimating we would get to this object the end of 2018, early 2019. We wanted to know more about it, and one of the ways we find out about little objects is to use this technique called stellar occultation. So imagine you have a bunch of observers uh, on the ground, somewhere on the Earth, and you've got a bunch of telescopes, and you're looking out, and you're going to look at the star, right? So you're going to look at that star out here, and the viewpoint of these different observers are going to be a little different to at the star. And then what you're going to do is wait for an object, usually a small object, so we call it a minor body, to go between the star and the observer. And so the star will blink out for a short time. And so if you have a path, you're in the right place on the Earth where the star goes right through the object, then you will get a, a, a lot of blinking out but if you miss it then you won't get any blink out or if you just go through the edge of it right so depending on where you are you will get to uh, measure a blinking out of that starlight and so by putting together a bunch of observations from various people along the path of that occultation <coughs> you'll be able to get a sense of the size of the object and its shape okay <coughs> So that's the idea. So there was a campaign to go look at the stellar occultations of MU69. At first they started off with three um, that were in 2017. One where you had to be down, in, down here in the Southern Hemisphere and I think they were looking in uh, South Africa. And then there was another one through here um, that was not a lot of places to go observe to see this one. Uh, and then here in, down in Argentina, there was another one added in Senegal. So um, these things don't last very long and you have to get a whole bunch of people out into the right place. Well, and so, did, yeah. Uh, did Sophia observe the one in, seven, uh, in July? There was a Sophia, so using a, um, a, uh, uh, a plane 
with a telescope in the plane looking out, and I, I think Sophia was used, but I'm not 100% certain. It was the first atmospheric detection. It may, well, they didn't detect an atmosphere. Yeah, they got you a may little, be. Little blip in their occultation on that one. Oh, well, they got a blip in the occultation. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, a student working with me, he actually is working on um, Juno data and uh, analyzing stuff at Jupiter, but he got sucked in by the, uh, the Swiri friends um, to go off and uh, do some uh, occultations. So, he was lucky to go off to Senegal. Uh, this was the rainy season, they only got one detection, but they got to eat some cool mangoes. Um, <laughs> When they went to uh, 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 Argentina, they had, a, had about 20, again, about 20 teams. And uh, here he actually has the US ambassador coming to help him. <laughs> and uh, he was lucky enough, you can tell it was cold, right? So there's uh, uh, summer up here, winter down there. And they did, with their telescope, detect Ultima Thule. Um, and uh, but he had to keep warm. I, I actually gave him this is my coat that I gave him to keep warm. <laughs> I didn't need it in July in Boulder, but he uh, went down there and got some observations, kind of cool. So this was a great experience. There were teams of people from local teams working with um, uh, observers flying down from the US. So it was a great international effort and a lot of people involved in these projects. Uh, and uh, here's Mark Bowie of Boulder's Swiri office, um, who is very proudly holding up his five uh, fingers because five chords were detected. So you can see all these chords here, and so of, of those, five of them actually measured a blip, and that was very useful for getting predictions of the shape and size of Ultima Thule before um, we got there. Okay, so now we have to think about flying by, and this is really difficult. It's really small, so 80 times smaller than Pluto. Pluto was hard enough. Uh, it's a, we're going for a close flyby um, because we really want to get in there and get, a, get, get some close high resolution pictures. We don't know the location. It was only discovered in 2014, so with a very long orbital period, it's sort of it's not like you can measure it orbit after orbit and get a very precise measurement of its orbit. Um, we have limited uh, measurements beforehand. We have no idea what it's like around there, whether there's debris. Um, uh, there's low, it's dark, so it's, you, you're going to have to integrate your camera, your, your uh, observations for a longer time, take longer exposures. Uh, and there's limited spacecraft power. We've been operating for a long time. And then on top of this, it takes 12, um, 12 and a quarter hours to send a signal up there to tell it what to do and then get the signal back again to the Earth. So you have to think of the New Horizons spacecraft as a robot. It is a robot. And so you tell it what to do. It goes, makes all these observations, click, 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 turns back to the Earth and says, I'm okay, I have my, my um, memory full of data, okay? And then eventually it sends the data back. So this is the, the plan for the, um, for the flyby. Here we are on the spacecraft, flies by, sun is over to the right, this is the plane of the planets. Um, this is the Ultima Thule is moving along this orbit. There's a shadow because the sun's over to the right. And then we're going to go past it like this and take pictures and other data too. So this is, gives you a sense of your navigating. This is the date, November 2018. We're going through November. Here is the object. Well, this is what you're looking at, the raw image. You process that and then you subtract the background stars. We're now December, and just towards the end of December, we're, we're making these, these measurements and we pretty much know where to look, okay? So the advantage of this is we now have a sense, we can, uh, as we move in there, get a sense of where the object is so that when we take our pictures, we're pointing the cameras in the right place. Now on the way in, um, we're concerned Finding some moons would be scientifically very interesting, but we don't want to crash into them, obviously. So the idea was to go look for rings or um, 
uh, moons, didn't find anything uh, bigger than about two and a half miles, so pretty small. Uh, we also were looking for dust because this is a, a, a comet that is shooting out a lot of dust. You don't want to go flying through that with a spacecraft. And so uh, we were looking for that, but we didn't actually see any, so that's all good. And so then it's all systems go for the flyby sequence. And um, so over a period of about two hours, you're going to be flying by, taking pictures at different colors, different resolutions, trying to focus in different places, do, some, um, uh, do a solar occultation with a UV instrument to look for an atmosphere. But this whole sequence lasts about two hours, okay? So, you know, you're going to go in, make all these measurements, load up your memory with data, turn back to Earth, say we're okay, and then slowly over a period of time, send the data back. So what were you expecting to see? We had from the occultation results got a sense of shape. And if you can see, so these are the dips out in the star, you can sort of drive a shape. And it kind of looks like it wasn't round. And the guess was, is it a sort of potato-like thing? Maybe with lumpy, lumpy bits. Uh, or is it two objects that are orbiting each other? or some other combinations. We didn't know at the time, but we had some hint that it wasn't perfectly round. Now it's so small, usually objects have to be 500 miles or so in size, 800 miles, in order to be pull themselves together, to be have enough gravity to pull themselves into a round shape. That's why being round is a major criterion for being a planet. Okay, Pluto is very round. <laughs> um, uh, so these, these things, there's no way about that. These are, but a lot of cometary objects uh, are not, or, or uh, asteroids are not round at all. Uh, also, we didn't know what the surface would look like. And, you know, it, there's a lot of guessing here. We can compare, this is thought to be a, a captured uh, moon, a Kuiper belt that got a little too close, object got a little too close to Saturn, got captured. Um, this is a comet CG that was observed by the uh, European mission uh, Rosetta. And then this is uh, another moon. And you can see of, of Saturn, you can see these are all very different surfaces. There's been a lot of erosion of this surface, sublimation maybe, spewing off gases as comets tend to. Uh, these things have been impacted, and who knows what's going on here. Looks like it's sand or something on the surface. Okay, so we didn't know what we were going to see. So here are the first images, and this was taken. So notice the date here. This is only 37 hours before closest approach, right? And this is the number of pixels sharpened, i.e. fudged. I mean, okay. I shouldn't be so disrespectful of these experts who fiddle around with images and do fantastic things with them, um, whether they're real or not. But, you know, <laughs> so, you know, we, we didn't see much, right? You sharpen it and you get that. Okay, so then, 31st of December, day before, do 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 do. What could it be? A bolly pin? Could be. Could be. Ha ha. Got a better sense of the size though. Okay. Now, at this point, um, the there was a big party going on New Year's Eve. A lot of celebration at uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in Maryland, and eventually everyone was waiting for the signal to come back saying that. The spacecraft's okay, there's data on board, and we just need to send it back. And indeed, there's the usual celebration of Alan Stern and the, the principal investigator of the mission, and the woman who is in charge, the mom, the mission operations manager, Alice Bowman, who ha had been told by the spacecraft everything was okay, and it had data on board. So everybody celebrates. And then the first picture comes down, and of course the scientists go bonkers looking at this fantastic little double, double object. 
So these are the first pictures that were released in time. These are called the New York Times. They actually call them the New York Times pictures um, <laughs> because we indeed wanted to get on the front page of the New York Times, which we did. Um, uh, but also it, it useful for the press coverage to give some sense of this is what we see. But just one day later, we went from that bowling pin to this. And so, you know, if you look at the, on your sticker, you'll see the pre-prediction object was kind of not too far off from this. Amazing, right? Um, and so it's a, a bilobate or a double object that seems to have been stuck together. Okay, so let's talk about the size. This is comparing this Ultima Thule with some of the terrain you were looking at on Pluto. Right, so it gives, it gives you some sense of the scale. But for hit, those of us here in Boulder, maybe this is a better way of thinking of it. This is Boulder County, and um, this is what Ultima Thule would look like. Okay? So it's pretty small. Remembering that Pluto and Sharon next to each other, or our moon, would basically fill the United States. Um, for, for comparison, this is Comet Jeromenkov Gerasimenko. I can never get that right. Anyway, CG, um, and that's for comparison, right, in size. So this is the comet, very dark, very broken up, very altered as it has moved around the solar system. Of course, you know, it was middle of winter, had to be called a snowman. Um, uh, kind of cool. Okay, so this is the best view. So this is a high resolution. You can see, actually, we go back from here. That was the one before, and then now we have a good high resolution observation. This was taken just before closest approach. And you can really now tell that is two objects. They've sort of called the bottom one Ultima and the top one Thule, because you need to call it something when you're talking about it. Uh, and now you can begin to see some features, okay? And um, there's big debates. This could be an impact crater, maybe here. These little ones here, maybe. Is this an impact crater? Maybe, maybe not. What about this thing? What about these lumps? Are these mountains on the other side? Is this... So, and, and then what about this collar? It's got a white collar. So, there are not a lot of features, but there's some real interest as to how this thing has been put together and what are we actually looking at here. As for shape, uh, this was the occultation sort of, uh, based on the occultation, where the dip outs were in the, the dips in the, the um, stellar signals that was observed from the ground. And when you suit, uh, overlay you can see isn't that pretty pretty darn good right um, they were getting the the shape well now when we look at color uh, and this thing called MVIC gives us color lorry gives us high resolution you combine the two and you get this sort of um, reddish object now where does that reddish stuff come from okay uh, well, it turns out that we, we're pretty sure that the ice is some combination of water ice, um, uh, methane ice, carbon uh, monoxide ice, nitrogen ice, all of those compounds. And if you have those ices sitting out in space, they're receiving ultraviolet light from the sun, they're receiving cosmic rays, from, from the outside part of the universe. They're receiving solar wind from the sun. And although the solar wind and the UV light are much weaker out here, they've been sitting there for four and a half billion years. Okay, so you don't see any geological activity on this thing. There's no, um, no, no uh, turning over of the surface. This surface has sat there and just been radiated for four and a half billion years. And so the chemical reactions have led to this um, reddish stuff, which like Pluto, is probably some kind of hydrocarbons because you put together carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, right? You're gonna get hydrocarbons. Okay. 
uh, so that's the idea. Um, what about that neck? Well, if you look at the gravity of two objects close together, then you have this sort of, um, uh, you have a slope, a lot of slope in here, where you've got gravity pulling things here, things pulling that way. So things would fall down into there. So the idea is that maybe that's an accumulation of fresh material that's been sort of knocked off by um, little impacts on the surface. That's one idea. Another idea is that uh, over a lot of its orbit it's been protected from the sun and the solar wind and so it just has been less processed. Um, but uh, it's, it's probably some combination of those factors. Any possibility that in the merging some ground up or released particles would still... Okay, so let's talk about the merging in, in a second, okay? But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that maybe you put out some dust. So in the... But remember that merging probably happened four and a half billion years ago. Okay. So let's look at this stereo view. Okay. So this is a two pictures you put together to make a stereo. And the man who really knows about stereo is Brian May. <laughs> he's really got into the whole stereo thing. And uh, he's, uh, he came to the, to the event and he was hanging out and uh, going to all the science team meetings and talking with the scientists. He has a PhD in uh, astrophysics and he studied actually um, material in the solar system, dust in the inner part of the solar system. And so he's interested in, he was, he put together these two, but you have to have a special Brian May special stereo thing, which we don't have, but we do have, here you go. Now there are, these are two versions of the, um, and I think the one on the left works better, but you may have a different opinion. And you can try them out. So what do you see when you do... Do you see, see anything special? It looks like there's a glue seam between them. <laughs> a glue seam? Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's glued together, doesn't it? Yeah. It does look more like that, doesn't it? But do you also see yeah. that the uh, that really does look like an impact crater, doesn't it, or some kind of dimple, yeah. right? The dimple down here is that, and then that one here, you can sort of see that. Yeah, really cool. So um, we only have this one 3D. This is the only one I have, but it's pretty cool to actually see it in 3D. Okay. Okay. So. What's interesting is um, the rotation, there we go, um, you can see the one on the um, left is where they're putting all the, all the images together and just having it spinning. The one on the right shows how we're it, zooming into it to get the high resolution on approach. But by looking at the one on the left, don't you see that the bottom bit Ultima doesn't look quite so round, right? Doesn't it look a little kind of maybe flattened? Yeah, yeah. Whereas the top one looks kind of round, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So um, playing around with the images, uh, the one on the left is taking the one on the right and just keeping it the constant size, right? So the one on the right is the actual images, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, but that's, you get confused by it zooming towards you, right? So if you just put them all together to make one uh, rotating image, you get the one on the right, one on the left, sorry. So is there any simulation for the one on the left, or is it just actual images? They're all actual images. Um, and so then, looking at these, um, the team inferred that instead of having uh, two round objects spinning around an axis. This, the center of mass is clearly over in, in Ultima. Um, the new view is that you've got a spin axis that may be closer to the neck. Um, and this is the shape that they're deriving. Now, you know, 
I'm not 100% certain that it's exactly quite as flat as that. It seems a little too flattened. I wouldn't be surprised if they'll end up coming down towards this as a shape and this may be a little bit more round. But that's the current idea is you've got one that's a little flattened and the other one's um, remaining fairly round. Now, how did this all happen? Okay, how did it get to be that way? So the idea for formation of objects in the outer solar system, or most of the solar system, is that you have a bunch of chunks of stuff coming together, coalescing, um, they sort of bump into each other, and um, if they've got enough gravity, they'll pull together, and the larger objects will begin to orbit around each other. The smaller objects tend to get scattered and um, either by the solar wind sort of blowing on them or bumping into each other or maybe gravitationally scattered by Neptune or something like this but the two that are left end up orbiting each other. Now what we think in the case of Ultima Thule is they came together to the point where they spiraled around and then eventually got close enough to bump into each other. So these things, we don't know the mass, we don't know the density, but they're probably fairly fluffy, low-density snowballs, okay? Pretty much like a snowball. So remember, these are 20 kilometers across. So these are big snowballs, 10 kilometer snowballs, but that's still pretty small compared to a lot of objects in the solar system. And the idea is they had to come together pretty much at walking pace really slow, just a few miles an hour maybe, okay? And so that's why they didn't smush and get broken up. That's maybe why you have that melt for the neck. Um, and uh, they seem to be orbiting around this common center of mass. Okay. What's the surface gravity? We don't know the mass. Okay. But if you, you could take an, um, estimate of a density of say half that of water and you could work it out it's pretty it's really low it's a, I think it's just a, f a few it'll be a f a f just a few meters a second I think CG, it's, it's hard to stick right you bounce off yeah you stuff jump off it and never come back yes no it is there's, certainly that's true with the comet the the Rosetta you know that remember it landed and then it bounced off again and then landed back again very low gravity yeah have two objects orbiting each other like that, they'll just orbit forever unless something takes energy away yes. from them a little bit. Do right. you have any idea what could be doing that there? So the question is, what, what could have caused these two objects that were orbiting each other to, to um, dissipate their energy? Um, that's a good question. We don't know. Um, you can speculate that it may be related to, um, there are actually uh, forces associated with the solar light. Um, radiation pressure, there's also the solar wind, which is very low pressure. Um, but then, you know, you can imagine that once they start bumping into each other, you'll have a little bit of gr crunching, grinding into each other. Um, but what is interesting is their orbital period is um, about, I think it's 15 hours, which is pretty slow. And so you would expect these things to be spinning, orbiting each other, and then crunching and rotating a lot faster. So there must have been some dissipation of energy. So that's a, a, a big mystery. We don't really know. Just another question I have. Does the fact that these things have impact to surprise you at all? Because you think that the bigger one would have probably more energy coming in. I mean, it's not even that probably So what's interesting here is to get, end up like this, You've got to end up, you've got to start off when you have the first sort of objects bumping into each other, coalescing in the outer solar system. Because, you know, once you get pieces condensing and forming snowballs, they are going to bump into each other because they're not all moving at exactly the same uh, speed. So they bump into each other. Um, and so often if they're moving fast, they'll break up and into small pieces. Uh, but if you get just the right sort of, uh, they're large enough to have enough gravity, um, but moving slow enough not to bash into each other and break up into tiny pieces, um, you then end up with this 
and some way of slowing them down, you'll end up with these things orbiting each other and then eventually coalescing. So is the coalescing, uh, co coalescence surprising? Not really, because when you look at a whole bunch of objects in our solar system, a lot of them, like this comet CG, but other ones, this is a comet Hartley, this is Borelli, uh, looks more like the bowling pin, um, they seem to be bilobate, so it's not that unusual to have two objects coming together of more or less the same size forming a, a, a two-body object. Wasn't, yeah. Right, so what's interesting is that when you look at Ultima Thule, it doesn't seem to have much in the way of the impacts. You look at this thing, comet, it's covered in impacts, this one covered in impacts. These things, these other things, are heavily processed. And the question is, how did it get to be so heavily processed? Whereas Ultima Thule is very unprocessed. Now there is some question that these pieces and this piece, this, this sort of round feature, suggests that these are the snowballs that formed, came together. You can sort of imagine this was a bunch of chunks that were sort of stuck together. Um, but why do we end up with um, th this object having far fewer impact craters than the other ones? So this comes to this idea of the populations of Kuiper Belt objects out there in the farthest part of the solar system. So to give you an orient orientation, the planet Neptune is at this orbital distance of about 30 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so we're out here, here's Pluto, at about 40 its average distance and then Ultima Thule is here. Now these different colors correspond to different populations in the Kuiper Belt. And this axis is the inclination of the orbit. So if you stay in the plane of the planets, the uh, ecliptic plane, the plane that the uh, Earth, all the terrestrial planets, and Jupiter and Saturn, and, um, Uranus and Neptune orbit, then you'll, you'll have a low inclination stay like this. Now Pluto, you can see its orbit is inclined, okay? Uh, but what's interesting is there's a whole bunch of objects that are at this distance, and this is a sort of magical distance because it's in resonance with Neptune. And so Neptune goes around the sun twice, sorry, three times for every twice that Pluto goes around the Sun. So it's a three to two resonance of orbits. And what tends to happen when you're in such a, a resonance is the inclination tends to get kicked up. So there are these objects that are called Plutinos that are resonant, that are in this orbit like Pluto where they have a high inclination. Okay, now there's a bunch of other objects that are also being kicked up to high inclination and these are called classical KBOs. That means they've been around for a long time. They're not actually in this resonance. Um, and they've been, they're called hot classical. Now, I wish the dynamicist did not use this phrase because it's really confusing. Everything out there in the outermost part of the solar system is really, really, really cold. I mean, the temperatures out there are minus 380 Fahrenheit, right? I mean, you know, they're close, they're about 40 above absolute zero. So it's cold. This hot and cold means whether they are dynamically hot, moving around all over the place, or whether they're dynamically cold, <laughs> not moving very far, okay? So, Ultima Thule is an example of a cold classical. Yes, it's cold, really cold on the surface, but it's also dynamically cold, and its orbit is in the plane, and it probably is an old primordial object that's been this way for three, sorry, four and a half billion years just hanging out there, okay? 
whereas these objects have been scattered up, the black ones, the hot classicals, have been scattered up into higher orbits, so they're sort of moving all over the place. Now, these uh, pink ones seem to have been scattered out, and these orangey ones have been scattered in, these are called centaurs, scattered towards the orbit of Jupiter, and this scattering has happened in the early part of the Sol system due to the gravity, mostly by the big stirrer, Jupiter, but also Neptune has sort of stirred things up. So this is the idea of what's going on. So if you get formed like this object way back when, four and a half billion years, and you just sit there, don't move a whole lot, you're just going around the sun, not getting, um, uh, kicking into things, then you stay this way and you end up being fairly pristine. Yes, you're accumulating muck on the surface due to radiation hitting the surface, whereas this object, Comet CG, was knocked from the outermost part of the Kuiper Belt inwards. It's a, a, a Jupiter family comet, a comet that comes, it's got an eccentric orbit, comes into the inner solar system, heats up, vents off gas and dust and stuff. It's bumped into a bunch of things. So yes, it had two pieces that came together and probably originally looked very much like Ultima Thule. But every time it comes in towards the sun, it's been changed. The surface has been mod modified and stuff comes flying off. So this is the sort of current idea, uh, and indeed Ultima Thule is the first time we've really measured a primitive, really primitive object, we think, and get a sense of where the rest of the stuff um, came from. Now remember that there's some debate about how Earth got its water, because simple theories of solar system formation would just have rocks and metals condensing to make the Earth and the inner solar system. The, to, the water to condense, you would have to be beyond the orbit of, of Jupiter, but somehow in the early formation, icy objects from the outer solar system got kicked in to be part of Earth and make our water, make us, right? So this whole process of solar system formation in evolution is key for us because it has to do with making us, bringing in water from the outer solar system to make humans, well, to make the oceans first, then the humans. Okay. Okay, so that's the big picture of why we go study these objects. Yes, they're kind of cool and neat and interesting, why they're different, but also because it's telling us about our solar system formation and how did we get here. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is some of the observations uh, that we were hoping to get back in the day of Pluto, flying past Pluto, uh, the particle uh, measurement instruments, Pepsi and Swap, measured the solar wind as we came in. We measured some heavy ions, stuff coming off the atmosphere, uh, and you end up with this environment, you have the supersonic solar wind being deflected around Pluto. You can see the scale, here's the US for scale. Um, and we flow through here, we measured this perturbed solar wind, and it told us that Pluto is in fact losing an atmosphere at about 10 to the 25 particles per second. Well, it doesn't matter what that number is, but what's interesting, this is a weird quirk of numbers for our solar system. It turns out that Mars, Earth, Jupiter, Pluto, huge range of size of objects, they are all losing their atmosphere at about the same amount, about 10 to the 25 particles per second. Now there's a little bit of maybe a factor of 10 fudging the knowledge of that number, but it's still pretty amazing, huh? Okay, so we don't know why. But what's interesting is we then go to Ultima Thule. So remember I had the United States for scale, always useful. Now we see the United States, here's Ultima Thule. We're a long way away, we fly by. We don't see any perturbation in the solar wind, just usual solar wind. And so we think that the solar wind just goes flying past is absorbed on one side, but remember it's spinning, so all sides get 
bombarded by the solar wind and that contributes to making it dark as the radiation of the, the electrons and protons hitting the surface causes the chemical reactions in the ice and, and darkening the surface. So, uh, no evidence of an atmosphere, no evidence for rings, no solar wind interaction, no satellites. So, pretty much as we expected, these extra pieces, which we saw a lot of this at Pluto, but, but this object, it was m mostly just pictures that we took. So those pictures are still coming down. Um, it'll take about 20 months to get all the data back, remembering that three kilobits per second data rate and uh, six hours to send the, um, the data from uh, the spacecraft to Earth. And uh, we have to share the deep space network with all the other spacecraft that are up there like Juno and MMS. Um, the spacecraft that's operated from here and, and uh, those Mars missions and so on and so forth. Um, so eventually we'll get all the data back, uh, but it'll take a while. Friend, yeah? Any dust? No, uh, the, no, no perturbation in the dust yeah. uh, other than the usual amount of dust that we see out there in the solar system. So we see a more or less continuous dust flux as we go from the Earth all the way out there, interestingly enough. And material from the outer solar system takes about a million years to, to come in. It, it gets, um, slows down and spirals in. Um, so what are we going to do next? This I downloaded today uh, tells us exactly where we are uh, in the solar system. And um, we've gone past Pluto past NU69, what else is there to do? Well, there are a bunch of objects, uh, Kuiper Belt objects, that we could look at. Uh, we would just be turning the cameras and looking at them, and we can try to do that. We won't resolve them, they'll be less than a pixel, but we can measure their light curves. That is how they change as they tumble uh, or spin. That tells us a bit maybe about shape, maybe about color, things like that. Um, or, as we go out in the solar system, um, we could maybe find another KBO target. Now, remembering that we had a hard enough time finding one with two degrees, so we got even less fuel. So it's going to be tough. I don't think the chances of getting a flyby will work. Um, but we can look at some of the objects while we're out there remotely observing them. Um, we have enough power to keep going, maybe out to about 100 AU. And so for comparison, if we look at Voyager 1, which of course both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are now out in interplanetary space, into stellar space, uh, beyond the uh, interplanetary medium, the, the solar influence. Um, Pioneer is now no longer operating, nor is Pioneer 10, nor is Cassini. New Horizons is the only spacecraft in the solar wind beyond the orbit of Mars. Juno is deep inside the magnetosphere of Jupiter, so this is the only thing measuring the uh, solar wind out beyond Mars. And so we'll keep measuring that solar wind, we will keep measuring that dust um, for as long as possible uh, and see what the conditions are out there uh, in the outermost part of the solar system. And with that, I will thank you very much. Now, I know some people uh, need to leave, maybe do homework or other things, but um, if you would like to ask questions, I'll be happy to hang around. Um, so, if you've got any questions, <coughs> far away. Yes? The, uh at the moon and such, you see, uh, even though there's no uh, atmosphere around it, you see some about uh, five, ten percent of solar wind protons getting reflected off the surface. Uh, but you didn't see any evidence of that. Oh, you're saying compared with our moon? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we were a long way away, <clears throat> so there's no way that we would have detected or been able to, s to really see anything reflected from it. 
I don't believe that the moon, the protons, solar wind protons and electrons that are observed at the moon, you've got to get up really close to see those. And I bet we wouldn't see it at these distances, especially given how small the object is. It would be great, but you'd have to get pretty close, and unfortunately we didn't. Right, yeah. You, it's true that you would get object, the, the, but it's, it's very low density and it's very hard. It, the chances are exceedingly slim. We didn't see any signal perturbation. Yeah, good idea though. Um, you also mentioned that the rate of atmospheric loss is the same for a wide range of planets. Yes. Uh, and obviously with the Earth's magnetic field, which does use magnetic field, and this thing probably nothing. It turns out that whether or not the planet has a magnetic field does not affect whether you lose a lot or you lose a little. Jupiter, remember, loses about the same number of particles per second as Mars, as Pluto. Go figure. But as a fraction of the cross-section that it represents? It's no simple relation. It, that's a great thesis. Go write it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might have said, uh, you, you pointed out there's some different material or, or at least a different brightness kind of in the neck. Of yes. Uh, what, what do you think that might be? Well, I think it's probably ice, but the question is, is it produced, uh, and it's, it's also a gravity sort of a slope, downslope, so it's a gravity minimum, if you like, between the two objects. So if you generate stuff somewhere else on the surface, say, be, Part of, uh, small impactors hitting the surface and you generate a little bit of, of, of dust, if you like, that will accumulate there. So fresh stuff will tend to accumulate there if you, if you knock it. Um, there's also an issue that you are actually, it, it receives less solar radiation because it's in the neck. You can imagine a configuration where it's sort of in shadow a lot. So it probably gets a little bit more shadow than a lot of the other, er the, the the bits out on the side so I you know I, w there's the geology team is arguing like crazy about this stuff so I just toss in my um, my part yeah good question in hindsight what instrument would you have had on New Horizons? <laughs> what instrument would I have added to New Horizons? Um, <sighs> one, only one Okay, so this is a really painful question for me to answer because I, can, I argued when we proposed this mission that it wasn't worth putting a magnetometer on it. And the reason why it was not worth putting a magnetometer in because out at this distance in the solar system, the magnetic field is so weak of the sun. The Voyager spacecraft, and you can see a model of the Voyager spacecraft outside here, had a 40-foot boom with a magnetometer on the end in order to measure the weak magnetic fields of the outer solar system. So we didn't, this small spacecraft, there's no way you could have a 40-foot boom. I said it wasn't worth carrying a magnetometer. And I was a chief you know, most vested to get stuff out of the magnetometer, and I said it wasn't worth doing it. There's no way that Pluto has a magnetic field. We can argue about that afterwards. The problem is we flew through the magnetosphere of Jupiter on our way to Pluto, right down the tail. And golly, wouldn't it have been fantastic to have a magnetometer on that part of the mission. So you asked me a very painful question, I have to say. Over here. Said that the density of dust particles has been about the same from Earth all the way. Yes. Up. What is that? Okay. I was going to ask you lot that. What do you think? <laughs> As we go out there through the solar system, we've got this thing, the student dust de detector, built here at LASP. That's about the size of a tray, right? The tray that you get at a cafeteria or something like that, right? And we're going through, and we're moving at something like 33,000 miles an hour. Yeah, you're just zooming along. How many dust, uh, what do you think the count is, the dust, per, okay, per, to per day? How many do you think impacts do we get a day? Anybody who's been in LASP and heard talks about, about that I've given about Pluto, <laughs> keep your mouth shut, okay? Someone who, who wants to make a guess? Go on. How many? One. I love theory questions. <laughs> Ten. Ten. Okay, you got it started. 
Any advance on 10? Anyone want to give me more than 10? This is per day. Dust hits. 100. Any other? Advance, up, down. One, okay. A day. Two a day. One a week. Shh. Yes. A tenth. About one every four days is what I think is the rate, right? Once every four days. It's actually fairly constant, which is really interesting, right? So space is empty, okay? <laughs> this idea that you go, this is even when you were going through the asteroid belt. This idea you have in the movies, right? You're going through the asteroid belt. How do you know how to get rid of the so, so what's, what's your lower mass threshold? Um, it's it's my these things are microns. They're they're really small. So, uh, but we haven't had a big hit either. We'd know that. Yeah. yeah. You you can see the zodiacal light. Um, I don't know if we've. I, well, I mean, it, it exists. We, we can see a little. Yes. Bit okay, but that's in in close in close, not further out. That's towards the sun. Okay. Any other questions? We're running out of steam. Okay, thank you very much.